Hi, I'm Stan Soloway, the Professional Services Council. I'm here with Ellen Glover and Robin Leinberger, who are co-chairs of the 2013 PSC Leadership Commission, to discuss the Commission's newly released report, From Crisis to Opportunity, Creating a New Era of Government Efficiency, Innovation, and Performance. Robin, start by telling me why this report and why now? Well, we found ourselves as, as leaders in the community at kind of a crossroads or juxtaposition of a, of a number of challenges that if we take action and, and can work to address them, could make a fundamental change. And that fundamental change in and around the area of how uh, the government, how our clients take advantage and, and utilize professional services uh, better than they do today to drive innovation, to drive change. And a number of those key issues uh, was the, is a changing in the demographic of the government worker uh, with respect to uh, age demographics and how they're um, aligned or arrayed across the various career fields. That's one. Second is the rapid change of technology and the difficulty that any organization, particularly the government's having, at keeping the skills relevant and up to date with the technologies that is uh, presenting itself. And then we have the, the uh, services acquisition rules, the, the relatively old set of processes that are having a challenge keeping pace with today's environment. Those amongst others if we can address that today, we can demonstrate and, and help uh, the government uh, be able to take more advantage of the technology today, the services that we offer, and to drive innovation. So, Ellen, as somebody's reading this report, one of the things that's made very clear early on is that this is not a report about acquisition, it's not a report about technology, it's not a report about people, it's a report about all three. And so, and, and, and you, as commissioners, make the case that that's what sort of separates this from previous efforts, is this holistic view. What has been wrong with the way we've approached change and reform in the past in government? Because we've had a variety of efforts like this over the years. What makes this different? Well, first of all, I, I think we have had a number of efforts, and, and some of them have resulted in some good changes. Um, but they have been very incremental in nature. And I think what we've really tried to do here is look at a holistic approach, both looking at all three of those components, acquisition, human capital, and technology. And typically, they're not, they've not been tackled as a is, is a combined problem. Um, and I think we've also tried to take both an industry and a government viewpoint. So we talked to a lot of folks inside of government, both at leadership levels and at working levels. And we talked to, uh, the commission included a lot of people from a variety of companies. And so we really brought in a lot of different viewpoints and tried to look very holistically at the problem and all aspects of it. And I think when you take all those pieces, they're all very interrelated. And you know, making a change to acquisition um, without considering the human capital problem, or making a change with human capital, not thinking about the impact of innovation and, and technology, the rate of technology change, really means that you're not really looking at the whole problem. And I think we really tried to do that in this report. And I think the recommendations really bear that out because they are they across all, all of those, um, and they also tackle the leadership issue, which is a very important part across all three of those elements. So the commission was comprised of 20 members of the PSC Board of Directors. You met with groups in the acquisition community, the IT community, the human capital community, and government, plus others in industry. What were the key findings that you found that, were, that, that everybody kind of agreed on? When you, when you, it says in the report that the findings were generally agreed to by everybody, not just by the commission itself. What were, some, what were those key findings? Give well, me three or four. One is, is a human capital gap. It's uh, kind of a camel hump. Uh, I think some of the statistics sound like um, nine times the number of 60-year-old uh, over 60 than uh, under 30 in the IT space. Um, the acquisition process is not serving uh, the acquisition of professional services and uh, the, the new methods of acquiring and utilizing technology. Uh, of course, we didn't talk about it a little earlier, but certainly uh, the constraints that the budget is placing on this and having to be uh, new and innovative uh, in the way we do that. Uh, one of the things we talked about was innovation being uh, the exception rather than the rule. It's happening, but it's not happening across the board. Another interesting thing I think we've gotten in the findings was the sense that everyone had about the, the need for more collaboration inside of government around program outcomes as well as with the external pro uh, partners you know, with industry. And I think that you know represented a sense of we need new leadership around we really need to work together in order to bring together the right community, those three communities we talked about earlier, um, to really solve the problems and, and, and get better outcomes for our missions. So we hear that a lot. We've heard it a lot over the years. We've got to work together. We have to work together. What was, what was the message you took away from the government folks you talked to? You mentioned 
internal government collaboration. We know there's an issue between government and industry. You talked about internal. What, was, what were those issues? That was quite interesting in, in that particular set of conversations um, were really about how um, each government entity, the chief information officer is more focused on you know, the, um, um, the, the criteria for his or her job and, and reducing costs and, and um, that, those kinds of focus. The, whereas the contracts person was more interested in, um, you know, making sure that the X number of acquisitions and had fewer protests, and there was a sense that no one was pulling them all together and really thinking about what's the mission objective, and actually perhaps embedding some of those criteria in their performance uh, review statements, so mm -hmm. that they were they were reviewed on the mission outcome, not on the process outcome for the acquisition officer, the Human Capital Office or the uh, CIO office. So Robin, let's turn right to the, the recommendations when we think about human capital and the challenge and crisis that you all have identified in the report. What are some of the key recommendations the Commission's making around human capital? Yeah, a number of the key recommendations result from some of the things we talked about. One around some of the cross-collaboration activities. So for example, it's uh, the training and development in multi-skills. So looking across the acquisition life cycle and having individuals trained on the multiple phases so they know how to work together. And next is looking at rotational assignments so that each of the, the various uh, types, whether it be an acquisition officer, a procurement official, a technologist, can kind of walk in the shoes of his counterpart, his or her counterpart, in order to understand what it takes to get that job done. Um, training uh, procurement individuals with technology skills and, and vice versa. Looking at um, internship type programs, at pe bringing people into the organization, working for a period of time, and moving them around to other parts of the organization so that you can address this cross-collaboration and multi-skilling in a way that hasn't been done before. This is an area, though, where you make some of the more provocative statements in the report, talking about it being fundamentally broken and right. fundamentally rethinking. I gather from the report that the Commission believes that the existing training and development infrastructure, particularly around acquisition, needs to be radically changed, yeah. the schoolhouses and so forth. It does, from the processes forward. So it's not just about how they train on, on the content they have, but actually going upstream and re-looking at the content, uh, how they're conducting services acquisitions in the, with the new technologies and the new opportunities today, moving to that end of it. And an example would be historically buying boxes, buying services by the hour, as opposed to today where we're seeing more and more opportunity to rent it or buy it and use it vis-a-vis -vis the cloud or as a service. Being able to change the processes and the approaches at how you acquire is going to require the skilling change, but it also requires different processes fundamentally at the beginning. Is the government suited to, to, to provide that kind of training and development? I think that the, the sources of that can come from, from anywhere in the marketplace. And I think that's a, a very valid question is who's best to service that? The, the marketplace, which there is a great marketplace to do that, who's actually developing and delivering these technologies or keeping it all in-house. And one might argue that if that's not going on in government today, how are they going to solve the fundamental problem? How should we do it? So certainly, minimally, there's an opportunity for government and industry collaboration in the development of the new curriculum. But what you're suggesting would be a sea change for government. It would absolutely be that. Ellen, let's shift over to the whole area of innovation. Um, since Ultimately, the report is about how to deliver higher value, better value for the government in, organically and, and through implementing partners. Key recommendations around driving a greater culture of innovation. At first, I think we, you know, our findings were there, there are instances of innovation in the government, and I think there were a couple mentioned in the report, um, but we've, what we find is they're the exception, not the rule. And so we're trying to come up with ways to make innovation more of a standard within, within acquisition and, and technology and program outcomes. So um, a couple of the recommendations. One focused very much on um, the point I made earlier about the need for um, collaboration on a program outcome across um, the disciplines of acquisition technology and human capital. And so we're, ask, we're suggesting that there should be that kind of um, leadership within um, individual programs. Um, we also have some recommendations around better in, uh, collaboration with industry. Um, doing mandatory debriefs and having um, a 360 degree um, review of an acquisition or reverse debriefing of an acquisition um, where the industry would comment on what happened and help get the government see better ways to do things. 
Um, we also have, um, have suggested that we could um, come up with a framework for scoring innovations within um, a procurement, which would be uh, something that PFC could deliver, which would give the uh, government a, a, a framework that they could put in any solicitation and allow them to score innovations in any RFP. One of the big parts of the report, Robin, is around the taxonomy. For You talked earlier about that, that, that how the government procures and utilizes professional and technology services, and there's a substantial amount of discussion in the report of, around the taxonomy for driving right. better business practices. Could you explain right. what that is? Sure. You know, and using the word taxonomy, so kind of for the record today, there is a taxonomy that the Defense Department uses, but it's really more of an accounting of, of categorizing where services uh, were procured or, or categorically over the past year. As opposed to the, the taxonomy we're talking about is, is really a framework that if you look on, on a continuum of professional services from those that might be low risk, highly repeatable, more on the commodity end of the scale, and then if you move to the right of this continuum, those that are sort of one of a kind, highly innovative, those you might see in R&D or creating that next new thing that doesn't exist today. And helping the government understand that there, that there are different methods and, and approaches to procuring or acquiring those services, different ways to view it, different acquisition techniques to do it, and much like Ellen said earlier, is then when you're getting in the far right, more around the innovative and the creative, how do you bring that in so that the value of that can be reflected in the RFP and scored, so you can really begin to differentiate those services, how you procure them, what you can get from them, and how you can measure them, again, to drive this innovation that we were talking about. So how does that differ from what's in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which theoretically sets forth that kind of a framework? Well, it does. And what we're doing as understanding how we deliver and what kinds of professional services is taking it a step farther and decomposing the service offerings that generally come from industry and then helping position those alongside of or along with what the Federal Acquisition Regulation already allows. Because what we see today is a mismatch. While they utilize those tools, they're not always utilized against a set of services that would yield the best result. In other words, those that might do a better job can get filtered out because of the acquisition process uh, and the tools and the techniques they choose to use on that particular So what you're really doing is creating a tool to enhance the business acumen of the, of the buying workforces. Yeah, actually. absolutely. With market absolutely. knowledge. With market knowledge. Yeah. Okay. So Alan, the last area of the report talks about the role of industry. Um, this cannot be done just by government. We're partners in the, we have skin in the game. Clearly, as much as I would like it to be different, PSE cannot declare the industry will do X, industry will do Y, but talk about some of the things that the Commission has committed as a Commission and PSC and others to doing going forward. And I think, you know, our, our findings included, you know, findings about um, the way government viewed industry and some of their concerns, um, you know, some of them being, you know, the uh, sense that um, our responses to RFPs have become more vanilla, and so how do we change that? Um, so we've looked at a number of things that we think that, that industry needs to take a look at. One for one absolute um, piece that we realize is a very thorny issue, um, but needs to be addressed in some way is bid protests. Um, we do think that the number of bid protests as they've escalated over the years does add to the risk averse culture of the acquisition workforce. And so it's something that we have to at least discuss what are the alternatives. So the PSC has set forth that we will put together a committee of folks to look very specifically at that issue um, in and of itself. I think some of the other things that we're suggesting are um, building some frameworks for training. Um, building some frameworks for RFPs that we think would be helpful, as I mentioned earlier, an innovation framework for an RFP um, that we think would be helpful and that we could provide to government as sort of a, a, a piece that represents broadly the industry view but um, can, can be used across the government in, in various ways. And then we also are committed to having a CEO council that will meet on a biannual basis to really talk about the findings and the recommendations in this report, what progress we're making, and how they can be evolved going forward. Because we know this isn't like sort of the, the end, this is the beginning of trying to really make our recommendations and changes in this um, dynamic uh, much better. So much of what you've talked about is what various agencies or government agency leaders can do, whether it's OMB or a specific agency. Is there a role for Congress in this? Yes, we, we think that there are some area for legislation and change at the congressional level. Um, as we talk about different workforce structures, um, who should be, a, how would they go about re-looking at uh, the acquisition training and where that comes from uh, are, are two examples of where Congress could weigh in. 
Great. Thank you both very much. The report is up on the PSC website, www.pscouncil.org. Robin Leinberger, Ellen Glover, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.